Welcome to Henry Christian Church Facebook Live. We're going to have a good time today. We're in the book of Revelation and we're going to do the church of Pergamos today. I hope that you come ready to, uh, to worship God and also take you some notes too. This is good stuff. It's good stuff to help uh, in these last days. Also, it is Liam and Eddie's birthdays. Now, of course, they're not the same age, but they're doing the same date. And of course, it is my, my and my beautiful wife's non-anniversary, not anniversary, non-anniversary. We were married on February 29th, so that's the 28th. We don't get an anniversary, but every four years and a non-anniversary every three. So, I love you, dear. See you later. After service. <laughs> And, and of course, I'll do a new slogan. The first slogan was, uh, the first slogan was, click it or ticket. Now with COVID, it's uh, mask it or casket. <laughs> All right, that was good. That was good. All right. All right. I mean, again, something getting ready to take place. You can look around, you can see what's going on around us. Something is getting ready to take place. It's all underlined. You can see it. You can feel it. Uh, it's in the air with, with all the stuff going on and all the right being called wrong and the wrong being called right and, the, and just a crazy mess that's taking place. We're getting ready to leave this place. That's why I'm doing the seven churches of Revelation and go a little further into Revelation uh, and the rapture because of all this. So we get ready to see the rapture and I really do believe that it's not that far away. So let's stand up and let's, let's sing about that, okay? I'll fly away. Ready? Look at say you're looking good this morning. Look at somebody say you're looking good too, in spite of yourself. Matter of fact, look at somebody say you look better with your mask on. <laughs> All right, ready? Ready? Yeah, that's when the fight started. That's right. Ready? Uh, one glass.
older I got, I lower y'all got. Amen. Now, how many have noticed what's going on outside? That's the first rain we've had in probably two hours. <laughs> Yesterday it didn't rain. I thought we were going to have a drought. Amen. Amen. Uh, ready? I feel, I feel the rain. Ready? I feel the rain. Church said, 
Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Y'all are looking good this morning. Amen. All right. Now, now we've been talking about, uh, let's back it up just a minute. I was going to tell you something. Uh, fresh out of business school, the young man answered a one ad for an accountant. Now he was being interviewed by a very nervous man who ran a small business that had started himself. I need someone with an accounting degree, the man said, but mainly I'm looking for someone to do my worrying for me. Excuse me, the accountant said, I worry about a lot of things, the man said, but I don't want to have to worry about money. Your job is to take all the money worries off my back. Wouldn't it be cool? I see, the accountant said, how much does this job pay? He says, I'll start you at $80,000. $80,000, the accountant explained. How much, I mean, how can such a small business afford a sum like that? And the man answered back, that's your first worry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is don't worry about what's coming down the line. Jesus has got this, okay? So now, just, just, I'm talking about this so slightly, just something as an introduction uh, into the seven churches. You know, the Lord, uh, he comes to his churches to speak to them about, first off, where they are and where he wants them to be. And he comes to them with a message of comfort. This message of comfort is a message of comfort and a message of challenge. So, so a lot of people look at the seven churches and they look at it as it's a bad thing. Uh, the message to the seven churches, but really, it's not a bad thing. Uh, if you go to the doctor and get a checkup, and the doctor tells you, well, this one thing is, I have a problem with this one thing, and we can catch it early, uh, we can do something about it. Wouldn't you rather get that checkup and catch it early, where well, you can fix it, than to let it be uh, when it's too late to do anything about it? So, so again, it brings them a message of comfort and a message of challenge, Okay. Now, let's go right into Pergamos. Now, now Pergamos itself, uh, it was a very special city. This city was actually the most northern of the seven cities. It was the capital of the Roman government in Asia. It had the world's greatest library. Uh, it was considered an intellectual center. And it was the center of Roman authority and Roman province. So this is a very powerful powerful city. I think you might connect, connect this to maybe uh, New York City, okay, in our day and time. It'd be like a New York City. And so, so, so here's these guys and they're staying in this city, in New York City so to speak, uh, or New York City like, or, or maybe a Los Angeles. Okay, but, but, but now, the church is right in the middle of all this. And so, in the middle of all this stuff, Jesus wants them to know, I know it's tough on you. I know it's hard. But I want you to know that I'm watching. And I know that you're in the hot seat. Because you're where Satan lives, where he dwells. You're in his main city. And so I want you to know that I'm watching you carefully. And when God watches us, it's different than, you know, I can watch you and maybe not do anything about it. But when God watches, he can do something about it. Amen? And so, so now, there's there Pergamos. There's a different type of message with every church. Every church is different. There were seven churches, seven messages. Well, of course, Ephesus, they had grown cold. And God said, y'all need to warm up. And then Smyrna was under intense persecution. Remember, these are church ages too now. And this was the age when the church was under fierce persecution. They had faced the heat. And God said, now... Y'all need to cool down. I'm not talking about cool down your spirituality, but cool down knowing that even though it's hot, I still got your back. Okay? Or maybe not necessarily cool down. Maybe let's say calm down might be a better way. But then there, there, there's Pergamos. Now Pergamos, of course, uh, the heat, they let the heat get to them. So matter of fact, uh, let me change this. Smyrna needed to calm down and Pergamos needed to cool down. Because even though they were doing a good job, they let what was going on around them get to them. Have you ever in your life been trying to please God? And while you're trying to please God because of all the things that's going on around you, it would get to you some way, somehow. 
It would affect you maybe by your attitude. It may affect your actions. But something would happen because although you were wanting to please God, the stuff around you was not conducive for spiritual growth. If you look at what we're doing right now, look at the world right now. It's getting to the point where church is a bad name. All right? It's getting where church is getting a bad rap. And that's sad because this world, this the United States was built on God. The other countries, they went to other countries looking for gold. They came to the United States looking for God. Okay? And now we're pushing God to the side or making God just a just a generic God. So, so, so he's watching all this. And so as he's watching this, he says this now, watch this now. This, this is, we're getting down to some nuts and bolts here. He's got an odd diagnosis going here. It's a four, fourfold diagnosis. So as he's watching Pergamos, he's going to tell them the good and the bad. There was three goods. And there was one bad. Okay? Jesus was saying uh, three out of four is bad. I've heard it said, and I've said it myself. Well, three out of four ain't bad. You ever said that? Well, three out of four ain't bad. God says, no, three out of four is bad. Because now there's something going on with that number four that's very, very, very drastic, and it's something that can actually take away the power of the church. And that was what was happening at Pergamos. I'll have to explain it to you as we go along. So let's just, let's just go along. We're going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. So first, uh, we're going to talk about, talk about, about the good. See, that, that if you look at the church, look at the circumstances of their faith. The situation uh, that they were in. They were actually staying where Satan's seat was. Wow. Can you imagine? You know, people say Satan's in hell and, you know, all oh, no, Satan's not in hell. Satan, no, 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 no. Satan is on earth. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, he's the God of this world and, and in Ephesians 2 and 2, he's the prince of the power of the air. He is not in hell. He's here trying to populate hell. Okay? And so now, he knows what he can do and what he cannot do. And there's certain areas where he has gotten footholds. And in where he's gotten footholds, just like I said, there's, there's footholds in the major cities, there's footholds in any city, uh, but, but that's where Satan is, in the footholds that he has, has opened the door and he stayed there. You've you, you, you got to understand, God sees that. And God knows that. So God knows how to give us strength to fight back, even though we may be where Satan dwells. He shows us that he's more powerful, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. The God of this world is nothing compared to the God above. Amen. We talked about the other night. Satan controls, but God is in control. Satan controls, but God is in control. Satan is the God of this world, but God is God. Okay? The great God, Jehovah, great God Jehovah is, he is in charge. He's in charge, in large, and in charge. Okay? So, so he knows our situation. He knows where Satan's seat is. He knows that if you're hurting, if there's something in your family going on in your marriage, in your family, uh, he knows that. God's watching. I know uh, Satan knows it, and Satan would love just nothing else but to just, just pour it on to you, but God knows that. Maybe it's something at your job or pressure in society or in your neighborhood. And, and you've got to understand, he knows where you live. And he has grace for every address. Amen? So, first thing, the situation uh, or, or the circumstances of the faith. Secondly, is the conviction of their faith. They're steadfast. He says, you, you hold this fast my name. No matter how bad it's gotten, you're still calling on me. No matter how bad it's gotten, no matter how bad the influences are, <coughs> you're still trusting me. You're still moving forward. So there was a conviction. And then there was the courage of their faith. It said, uh, uh, thou uh, has not 
denied my name. Now, now first, let's go back to the steadfast for just a minute. He says, uh, he told me, he said, you dwelled in Pergamos. Now, that word dwell, uh, this all ties in. That word dwelled in the New Testament, there's two words for dwell. One word for dwell means temporary, like a tent. The other word for dwell is permanent, more like a house, okay? And in Pergamos, what he's saying is, it's a permanent residence. What he's saying is you've settled down to stay. You've taken up per, per, uh, 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 permanent residence in Pergamos. You're not being run out of town by Satan. Okay? I don't want to be run out of town by Satan. Amen? So, and secondly, sacrifice. You know, the Bible tells us that we're just reading, it talks about Antipas. And, and now remember, there was, uh, here, here's, how, here's how history goes. You have the apostles. Then you have the apostolic fathers. And then you have the church fathers. It's three generations of people. So, of course, you know who the apostles were. Then the guys that they trained that come out of them were the apostolic fathers of the church. And the guys that they trained were called the church fathers. So, so now one of them was Antipas. Now, Caesar, <clears throat> Caesar wanted to be known as God. So he didn't care who other well gods you served as long as you put him number one, put him up, put him in charge. And once a year you had to go into the temple and you had to burn incense to Caesar and declare him God. Wow. So now, let's see Antipas. Antipas said, I'm not going to do it. And so because he would not do it, they said, if you're not going to do this, then we're going to kill you. And he says, do what you may, but I'm not going to burn incense. And that was what was wrong with the church to begin with. Why, why, one of the reasons why Rome was fighting them so hard is because the church refused to burn incense to Caesar. And so they took Antipas. Now watch this. Antipas was placed inside a brass bull. When he was placed, placed inside the brass bull, offered to recant, he would not do it. There was a fire built under the bull, and Antipas was roasted to death. Wow. And we get upset when somebody calls us a holy roller. Mm. We get upset when we actually are uh, wherever at a restaurant, and we go to pray, and somebody points at us when we go to pray and talk about how bad we are. Can you imagine being put in a brass bull and roasted? All because you stand for Jesus Christ. He's called my faithful martyr. Now, now Jesus was also called the faithful martyr. So that's something very powerful. Something very powerful was going on there. So look, they had not denied my faith. They're still holding on. They're trusting God in the middle of it all. So now, now let's talk about the bad. We talked about the good. There was some good stuff. And even in the middle of all that good stuff, there was some bad stuff. You're saying, well, now, here we go. Now you can start meddling. No, Jesus didn't meddle. Jesus told you. He's the only one. The only one. Anybody, anybody ever tells me, I just tell it like it is. No, you don't. You tell it like you see it. You tell it by your perspectives. Nobody knows how it is except for one, and that's Jesus. And so Jesus, he's telling it like it is. Okay? He says, but I got a few things against you. Okay, so now let's just go a little bit further in this thing now. <laughs> now this, this, is kind of, this, is, this is kind of a rough thing going on here. He's talking about how great it was. Antipas is, is burnt. All these guys are being killed because they will not recant. And now God says, well, there's still, some, there's still a few things that you got going on. First, there's corruption. There's corruption in the church because of the doctrine of Balaam. Now watch the doctrine of Balaam. Uh, Balaam is probably one of the strangest characters uh, in the Bible. Balaam, you know, you've heard about, you know, Balaam and, and Balaam and his mule. Okay, uh, he's, there, he's an enigma. He's a real mystery because on one side he's intimately acquainted with God, but he also was greedy. And because he was greedy, uh, uh, the king came to him and wanted him to curse God's people. And say so we're going to curse God's people for profit. Why? 
Watching all this, you can see stuff like that going on all around us now. This this Pergamos. Matter of fact, I, you know, although we're in the last age, Pergamos. Actually, as I started reading about Pergamos and studying Pergamos, I could see the age that we live in and what's going on around us. Okay, and so so again, so 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 uh, the, uh, King of Moab wanted wanted him to curse God's people, and even when he tried it, it didn't work. So what he did was. If he couldn't curse them, then he led them in a bad way of idolatry. So instead, he still took away their power. Okay? So there was corruption, the doctrine of Balaam. And then there was confusion. Okay? And that was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, the Nicolaitans we're going to talk about later uh, when we go into the seventh church. But it says, both these things I hate. Now, Nicolaitans literally... Uh, the Nicolaitans, Nic, uh, uh, Nicolaitans means to conquer the people. It's during this time of Pergamos that the Catholic Church got its foothold. Up until the time of the Pergamos Church, the, <coughs> the church had been persecuted. Smyrna had been beat up, been ransacked. But what they discovered is as they kept fighting Smyrna, Smyrna kept growing. As they kept persecuting Smyrna, Smyrna kept growing. So Satan knew that he was going to have to try something different. If you look in the book of Acts, whenever there's persecution, whenever there's problems, the church grew mightily. I'm expecting the church to grow right now before we take off. I really expect it to grow. Not because of some great big fancy uh, revival where everything's just handed to us on a silver platter, but because of persecution. Okay? And so, so Satan knows now if he cannot uh, uh, destroy them through persecution, he will rock us to sleep with prosperity. He will rock us to sleep with prosperity. There's a whole thing going on during this time. Uh, in 312 AD, Constantine was uh, one of the rulers of Rome. Constantine, in 312 AD, he was fighting a battle. As he's fighting a battle, he looks up and he sees what he calls the vision of the cross of Christ. And when he sees the vision of the cross, he says, okay, through the cross, and he heard it, yeah, through the cross you can conquer. And so, he began to call upon the cross and call upon Jesus, and of course he won. By the time he got back, by 325 A.D., they had made uh, Christianity. Remember now, Smyrna, the Romans were burning the Christians. Antipas being burnt alive. By 325 A.D., Christianity had become, had become Rome's state religion. And because it had become Rome's state religion, here comes the rise of the Catholic Church. And it's during this period of Pergamos, the Catholic Church was trying to keep up with all the heathen practices. So they could have some competition. So they were trying to compete. It's kind of like, you know, Burger King gets a fish sandwich, and so then uh, Hardy's gets a fish sandwich. Hardest fish sandwich sales, and so now uh, uh, they go off another restaurant. Wendy's, they get a fish sandwich because they're all trying to keep up with each other. They're all trying to keep on. And, then, and now, because Taco Bell does good, some of those stores, even now, the hamburger joints, even offering tacos because they're trying to compete with one another and trying to make it a one stop shop. Well, that's what happened with the Catholics. Up until this point, the priest could marry. Up until this point, they did not pray to marry. Up until this point, they literally, it was more like, think of a Baptist church. But up at this point, now uh, the Nicolaitans, now the Pope has got an order. The Pope is up there and they're making all these creeds and stuff. And, and so now the priests, because they're trying to be like the heathen gods, the priests and the nuns were forbidden to marry because they were said to be, just like according to the gods of the heathens, uh, started praying to Mary. And, and they also started uh, having demigods and started praying to the saints. So all this started happening during Pergamos. 
So there's a lot of things going on here. And God looking at this thing, and, and also there was a big division between the priesthood and the common man. And they even took the Bible away from the common man and said, anything we want you to know, we'll tell you. Wow. That's dangerous. Okay? And so, God says, I hate this. I do not like this. And so, 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 so there was the, the, the compromise of their faith. And then, there's a, uh, they're getting into ugly. Y'all ready for the ugly? <laughs> Alright. He says, repent, <coughs> or else I will come unto thee quickly. And I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. I want you to notice these words, these pronouns. Repent or else I will come against thee quickly and I will fight them with the sword of a man. He's got the sheep and he's got the goats. He's got those that are in the church that are professing Jesus Christ but they're corrupting it. They're tearing it all to pieces. And he says, I'll tell you what, repent. Change your mind. Decide that you're not going to allow this to be happening anymore. <clears throat> He says, I'm going to come quickly and I'm going to fight against them, not you, them. Those that are bringing destruction to the church, I'm going to destroy them. And I'm going to do it with the sword of my mouth. The word of God identifies those that aren't doing it right. You say, well, how can we tell who's doing it right and who's doing it wrong? Watch the word of God. The word of God is how we learn this stuff. The word of God is our roadmap. The word of God is our identity. One thing you guys see is love. Remember, Satan can mock the gifts, but he cannot, he, he cannot uh, mock the fruit. Okay? So love is one thing to look for. Number two, the word of God in his purity, not uh, uh, made some crazy mess or, or just pulling a little spot here and there out and making a whole doctrine on one little bitty piece of scripture, but it's the whole scripture rightly divided. So that's how you watch this. This is how you stay uh, in tune with all this. And now watch this. Uh, this has come to my favorite part. Here it is. Repent. I'm coming quickly. And I'm going to fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Here it goes. The best. Ready? They're ready for some good news. The challenge of their faith. He to have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh, will I give to eat? of the hidden manna, and I'll give him a white stone, and in a stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, save he that receiveth. Let's just, let's just talk about this a little bit. First we're going to talk about the hidden manna. Now, now, now you got to understand, in the Old Testament, the children of Israel, when they wandered through the wilderness, how did God feed them? Manna. And when you had the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, what was in the Ark of the Covenant? There were, there, what am I? Did you say 50 bandits? What? <laughs> the Ten Commandments. Oh, the Ten Commandments. I thought it said 50 bandits. Okay. Y'all you know, read the Ali Baba stuff, you know, the, 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 the Arabian Nights. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the Ten Commandments. The, the, the stones. The stones. Okay. What else was it? The rod that budded. And what was the other thing? A pot of manna. What is it we don't have anymore? It's, it's been hidden. Do you know it's believed very much so uh, back in the day uh, that, that manna was a Jewish, or at least the Jewish tradition says when the Babylonians uh, came to take God's people, Jeremiah hid this pot of manna. He hid it. And it believes that when the Messiah returns, we're going to get a chance to eat of it again. It's going to be revealed. So he's talking about something now. He's talking about on the other side. He says, for those that stay faithful, to those that stay true, to those that hear what I'm saying and overcome with all this mess you're watching, uh, coming on here with, with, with the corruption uh, and, with, uh, and uh, with the confusion, watch this. He said, I'm going to give you a chance to eat of that white or eat of that... Uh, Man. Then let's go a little bit further. Let's go, let's do this one. Still we end up, we're still in the best, okay? Now we're going to talk about the white stones. 
This is my favorite one. You see, the white stone, let's just stop. I didn't mean to put it all there together. I was going to put them all there then. Go ahead and see them all at one time. I'll just talk about them individually. Okay. The white stones. White stones have a very, to us, white stones mean nothing. But back then, white stones were very powerful. White stones were a very powerful, powerful thing. Matter of fact, uh, it was something of, of status to have white stones. Okay, so watch this. Uh, a new decree, a white stone. The Lord promised to give a white stone to the faithful ones. Again, let's talk about it. Number one, a white stone was used to indicate judgment in the courts of the law. In the courts of the law, if you were given, if you were judged guilty, they gave you a black stone. If you were judged not guilty, they gave you a white stone. It was yours to keep, yours to prove that you have been acquitted. Okay? So, so saying, you might be blackballed by the world. Where we get the word blackballed from? The black ball. So, or the black stone. So you may feel like you've been blackballed by the world. But God's watching. He's got this. And so, <clears throat> you make it through this, and you get to the other side, you're going to have that, look, you're going to have that white stone. Secondly, the white stones were used to signify citizenship. A white stone was often given to people who had proven their allegiance to the city. And because of that, Jesus honors us who lives for him now. He's going to be giving us citizenship in heaven. Also, white stones were used as a symbol of victory. They were given to those who had won victory in one of the ancient games. These white stones were called the Tessera or the Tessera. And the Tessera or Tessera, uh, the, they, the owner, uh, they could take that white stone, that Tessera, and anywhere they went in the city, they were allowed free access because they had won in the games. When we get to heaven with that white stone, guess what it's going to be like? Whatever you want, whatever you need, it's going to be there. It's a symbol of victory. A courageous gladiator would be given a white stone with the initials SP on it. And that was spectators. And it meant that his valor had been proven beyond all doubt. God says, when your valor is proven, I'm going to take care of it. And then the white stones were a symbol of friendship. Often two friends, when they were really, really close friends, they would take a white stone and they would break it in half and write the other friend's name on the other half. We get, now we have them for necklaces. You know, for best friends and daughter and mother and father and son and whatever. And they're, you know, they're half and half and you can put them together. Well, the same way, it was a symbol of friendship. They would take these stones. And after they took these stones, they would write their friend's name on it. So if they met years down the road, they could always pull out that stone out of their pocket and stick it to the other person's stone and their names would be on that stone. Signifying their relationship. And finally, white stones were used to gain, uh, to gain access. Uh, if a wealthy person threw a party, they sometimes gave their invited guests the white stone. So when you come to the door, you were only allowed in if you had the white stone. That's it. If you didn't have the white stone, you ain't getting in. Kind of like a PCDC, if your name ain't on the list, you ain't getting in. Okay. So, so a person was presented a white stone was granted access or access to the banquet. Guess what banquet we're going to be getting access to? Marriage supper. The marriage supper of the Lamb. And then, my, then let's go ahead and make it, let's just do one more thing and then we're getting ready to get ready to close out. I do a new designation and on that stone a new name <laughs> which no man knoweth except the end that received it. Now, I wrote it all down up here for you to see this. You just got to see it. Ready? It's customary for gifts at a dinner to have a white stone placed in their seat. When they were seated, they could look underneath and there would be a private message from the host. It was the way that the host could share an intimate thought with each guest. We we'll talk about the rewards in heaven. We we'll talk about the stuff. But well, you know what? One of my greatest things that I can't wait to get a hold of 
when it's all over with, is I want to be able to hold the water stand. With a new name on it. Something special. Something special is in the air. We can see it. We know it. It's getting ready to happen. Hold on. As time goes by, and I'm, and when I say time goes by, I'm going to start talking. I'm, 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 I'm calling out the whole political process. The whole political process is full of corruption and confusion. Nobody even knows the truth about what's going on. We don't know. We've got some perceptions that some people tell us, but we don't know the truth about what's going on. If we did, it would probably scare you so bad, you know, or you would change the way that we would try to change the way we did business in the United States because we really don't know what's going on. Confused? Corrupted? And God says, hold on. I'm getting ready to show up. And when I show up, I'm going to show up. You're not here by yourself. I'm watching. I see where you live. I know what's going on. And I'm going to show I've got this. You just hold on. You do your part. You be like Antipas. Doesn't matter what you bring my way. I know who I believe. And I know who I'm going to stand for. You see, remember this. We're insulated. We're not isolated. There's bad stuff out there. It gets worse all the time. I still remember initially when this shutdown took place, it was going to be for 14 days. Really? That's the longest 14 days I've ever seen. And it was the vaccines started coming. Everything would get back to normal. Really? The place is set up for Jesus to come back. And the sad part is a lot of folks can't even see it. Everybody else seen it. Brandon, come up here and scroll us in. We've been so shielded from the reality of what's happening in the world. We don't have crosses on our road with people claiming Christianity on them, although they do have them over in Iran and in that area. Now, today, crosses up. We have no idea what it's like not to be able to call on God whenever we want to in a public place. But all over the world, they've suffered that. But all that stuff, because of what's going down with this virus and all this other stuff, the one world government coming, it's getting ready to happen. We're going to see it. But Jesus says, hold on. I got you. I'm not going to let you fall. I got a white stone. I got a white stone waiting for you. All you got to do is trust me in all of this. Everybody bow your head. The very first question I'm going to ask, well, every head's bowed, every eye's closed, are you ready for what's coming? Are you ready to the point, number one, you know your relationship with God is so tight that if you had to offer yourself up, you could do it because you knew God had you. And if you don't, do you want it to be that tight? Nobody looked around, every eye closed. And if you're saying, I want my relationship with Christ to be tight. Nobody looking around, but just put that hand up and say, that's me, Pastor. I, I, want, I want my relationship tight. 
I, I want to be ready. Whatever comes, I want to be ready. There you go. Put your hands up. Yes. I want to be ready. 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 It's coming sooner than you ever could imagine. Maybe you're here today. And although you said I wanted to be that way, you still need God to help you get that way. Would you put that hand up and say, pray for me, Pastor. Pray for me. Bless the Lord. Bless him. Bless him. We're getting ready to leave this place. But until we do, we're going to have to keep the faith. We're going to have to fight through the struggle. And know that God's got us all the way through. All the way through. I want everybody to put their hands up. Everybody. I want you to repeat after me. Lord, Lord help, me help me in this last day. I'm not sure what's coming. I'm not sure what's coming. But I do know it's going to get rough. Help me, Help me to stand strong, strong. knowing no. there's a white sun waiting. And I thank you for it, Lord. I can't wait to get that white sun with a new name. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we thank you. And Lord, and the people said, God's people said, Amen. Tuesday night, we're, we're having a good time. Last week, we went again through uh, the last day timetable, uh, just a, a overview, and and uh, I meant to have you some outlines today, and I, I, it slipped my mind uh, of the rapture, but I'm trying to have you the outlines from last week of the rapture out here next week, and an outline from Pergamos. I don't want you to have all this stuff. You need to have this stuff. You got to end it, have it readily available so you can look at it. Matter of fact, if you want to really be smart about this thing, go get you go to Dollar Tree, get you a dollar notebook, and take these outlines and put them in that dollar notebook. And then you can flip through them and you'll have them all together. You put them in that notebook, they'll stay together. You put them in your Bible, you you go. I got here somewhere. But you got that notebook, you can pop it open. Because people are really starting to get concerned. And people are starting to ask. People I never thought in a million years would ask were starting to ask. And so you need to have this stuff. Because remember, to be warned or be forewarned is to be ready. Amen? Our hearts and minds clear? Y'all, did I tell y'all looking good? For well, most of you. Brother Doug, you spent some prayer, please. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us here together to hear your word. Lord, may we search your scriptures daily, which would give us understanding of what is to come, which would have us to do. Lord, may we on you, that you may try those before us, and we will always trust you. You have been found to be a part of us, let our light shine for you.